Episode 2. The King is Naked. It is to the sound of these bagpipes that, every morning at seven, King Charles wakes up. It comes from the garden of the royal residence and is played by Major Paul Burns, the last in the prestigious line of musicians in the Sovereign's Bagpipe Players, a tradition that began in 1843 at the request of Queen Victoria. There are two seven-minute sessions, separated by a one-minute break, needed to retune the instrument. Meanwhile, Charles sips tea from a Chinese porcelain cup. On the bedside table, the newspapers, arranged on a tray. Next to him, in the double bed, there is not Camilla. The two, as per tradition, do not sleep together. Instead, there's little Teddy. The pair are inseparable. Charles has been very attached to it since childhood, and even more so since those sleepless nights in the Gordonstone dormitories, where the stuffed animal was his only ally and comfort. Even today, despite the fact that an eye and an arm are missing from the patched-up teddy, the king cannot do without it. For most of his life, Charles has begun his days doing handstands, often in his underwear, an exercise Canadian Air Force cadets have perfected to keep back pain at bay. The morning routine then proceeds with the toilet, where Charles expects to find lukewarm water and about an inch of toothpaste already squeezed onto a toothbrush engraved with his initials. At this point, the king has his trousers put on, the buttons of his pre-iron shirt fastened, and the laces of his shoes tied. He wears a bespoke suit from a Savile Row tailor, a custom shirt from his German street shirt maker, and specially fitted shoes from his cobbler. A frankly enviable wardrobe, but certainly not in step with the times. He is often seen wearing 40-year-old tweed jackets, sometimes visibly patched. Charles is in fact deeply opposed to any type of waste. He despises so-called fast fashion, and when he can, he tries to make his clothes last as long as possible. By the age of 21, he spoke out against the excessive use of plastic and synthetic materials in the name of the environment becoming one of the first exponents of re-wearing the practice of showing off the same garment several times, a daily practice for us mere mortals. At his son Harry's wedding, for example, in accompanying Meghan Markle to the altar, he wore a 35-year-old suit, still in perfect condition. Not surprisingly, Vogue UK even called him an icon of sustainable style. While Charles gets dressed, the Scottish bagpipes give way to the radio, tuned to BBC Radio 4, Today Show, which accompanies him until breakfast. Charles is always informed about everything. The King pays close attention to what he eats. It's almost an obsession. For him, health is intrinsically linked to food, and he strongly advocates for an antioxidant diet or one made of little or raw food. That's why, for the most important meal of the day, Charles prefers seasonal fruit, organic honey, cereals, and hard-boiled egg, cooked for two or three minutes, and a cup of Darjeeling, the finest of black teas, always at 70 degrees. Charles never has lunch. Indeed, he considers lunch as an obstacle that weighs down work. At the latest, when he's in the residence, around 1pm, he takes a break to munch on nuts or other cereals during a walk in the garden where he often holds conversations with the plants. Everyone knows, he said in an interview with the BBC, that it is important to talk to plants, but few know that they respond. Said in this way, they may seem like the words of an eccentric person. In reality, Charles has a very deep, almost mystical bond with nature. It was given to him in the 70s by Lawrence van der Post, a South African explorer, soldier, writer, and philosopher. An incredibly magnetic character who became Charles' spiritual mentor and great friend, and in 1982, became William's godfather. For Van der Post, God manifests himself in nature, conceived as a unique and sacred entity, 
an organic whole pervaded by the same spirit and by a great universal harmony, which man is called to recognize and preserve. A naturalistic pantheism, born from the long period spent by Vanderpost in close contact with the Aboriginal populations of Africa. Lawrence Vanderpost's wife, Ingeret, was no less interesting. She is a psychoanalyst belonging to the school of Carl Jung and firmly convinced that the purpose of every human being is self-realization. As a result of her influence, Charles went into secret contemplation for some time. The afternoon spent together with the couple had a disruptive effect in the education of the heir to the throne, who approached disciplines such as surfism, sacred geometry, nettle culture, dream interpretation, and so on. In addition to expanding the young prince's intellectual and spiritual horizons, Van der Post had another type of effect, that of investing him with an existential mission, which transcended from the celebratory role of an heir to the throne. The path of the renewal of humanity, he wrote to Charles in the letter, can be guided by those who belong to one of the few symbols accessible to us, the symbol of the crown. Where were we? Ah, yes, discussing the fact that Charles never has lunch. The first meal of the day arrives at 5pm, often in the company of Queen Camilla. Tea, a couple of sandwiches, a slice of fruitcake, and another boiled egg. For dinner, King Charles follows a plant-based diet to reduce his carbon footprint. In the case of official banquets or formal dinners, he requires a separate menu, just for him, cooked by his staff. After dinner, the king returns to his desk, where he remains until well after midnight. According to his son Harry, Charles often falls asleep in his chair, his forehead glued to documents in which he is engrossed. The work of a sovereign never ends, and Charles, who inherited a profound sense of duty from his mother, is notoriously a workaholic. In fact, in 2022, he attended as many as 507 official events, including inaugurations, hearings, banquets, in addition to meetings and fundraising galas for the dozens of charities that he founded. His agenda is already planned for the next six months and drawn up with military precision, so much so as not to allow for delays or changes in plans. For this reason, during the day, Charles drinks enough water to sustain himself, but not so much as to require a sudden pit stop to the toilet. If the typical day of Charles III seems dictated by special needs, wait to find out what happens in the case of travel. According to Michael Fawcett, his formal butler when he was Prince of Wales, Charles used to carry everything with him. From foods produced in the Highgrove residence, such as eggs, cereals and honey, to the most disparate objects of daily use, including sometimes the orthopedic bed, the toilet seat with attached toilet paper, and even the paintings to hang on the walls of the rooms where he would sleep. In the event of dinner invitations, his entourage would show up with premixed martinis to be served to the Prince of Wales before dinner, strictly in a glass brought from home. In reality, the debate is still open on the veracity of most of these meticulous reconstructions or burning revelations that have emerged over the years from the mouth of ex-butlers and collaborators, experts or journalists, and is destined to remain so. But we can all agree on one thing. That is that Charles, like many members of the British ruling class, has long been pervaded by a deep sense of entitlement. That innate conviction that the privileges you enjoy are due to you, and that by divine right you are always, and in any case, a cut above the rest. According to Tina Brown, author of the book The Palace Papers, the complexity of the habits and charms of King Charles is due to an innate nostalgia for Edwardian grandeur. That brief golden age that characterised court life at the beginning of the last century, when the sun never set over the British Empire, and all the English aristocracy did was giving orders to servants and amusing themselves in sumptuous banquets or garden parties. Yet, what distinguishes the new King of England 
rather than the vices or whims of a man born and raised in a dimension that we mere mortals could hardly define as familiar, is the fact that during his long wait to rise to the throne, he has shown a willingness to put his privileges at the service of concrete objectives. If up until the 1980s he was considered as an eccentric and somewhat out-of-this-world figure, today the perception is quite different. King Charles has carved out a role for himself, a mission, managing over the decades with dignity and constancy to build his own image, or rather, rebuild it, after the abyss into which he had sunk in the eyes of the country after his divorce with Diana. It all started in 1994. There were a thousand days left before the return of Hong Kong to China and the formal end of the British Empire. Italy loses the final against Brazil, Mandela is elected president, and Elizabeth II inaugurates the Channel Tunnel. It's not an easy year for Charles. The crisis with Diana had exploded, into a war in the press with no holds barred, and the popularity of the heir to the throne is at an all-time low. In that year, in an attempt to defend himself from the accusations, Charles, in an interview that went around the world, had declared himself guilty of adultery, confessing to betraying the most loved woman on the planet, an imperishable icon of beauty, style and virtue. Cheated on her? With whom then? Camilla. Horse, smoker's voice, yellow teeth and muddy riding boots. The press was demolishing him with huge headlines, not fit to reign, garnering the sentiments of many. Two thirds of the British wanted his son, William, in his place in the line of succession. In September of that year, Charles went to Barou, a town in the south of France, for a few days of solitary relaxation. The heir to the throne takes a dip in the pool, goes up to his room and changes his costume. He does it in front of a wide open window, and that's where the paparazzi immortalise him. The next day, in the tabloids of half of Europe, the royal jewel of Charles stands out. Those photos, circulated far and wide throughout Europe, were promptly covered up by the palace and never saw the light of day in London. Yet, that embarrassing incident marks, metaphorically, the lowest point reached by Charles in the eyes of the world. And it is precisely starting from 1994, from that moment in which he found himself naked and in the pillory, that the heir to the throne had to and was able to get back on top. A 30-year journey, a daily commitment always carried out with a low profile, head down, heedless of criticism, gossip and public ridicule. Of course, the controversies about his extravagant requests and his eccentric habits still appear sometimes in some tabloids, but in the minds of the British people, they have given way to a sincere appreciation for his concrete efforts around the central values of his time, as we will see later. There's no denying it. His keen intelligence, sincere curiosity and his vast knowledge have managed to make him one of the most knowledgeable and influential people in the world. The merit of all this? A woman, long hidden in the shadows.